You know, the title of my lesson is almost unbelievable. It all started out that Krista asked me what the title of my lesson was. And I told her, oh, something from the Bible. So if you look at the schedule for tonight, she put, in quotation marks, <laughs> something from the Bible, which is a wonderful blessing. You know, when you need help beyond the things that you can do, you want to go to an expert, right? Like if your air conditioner goes out at your house, you don't want to fix that yourself unless you know what you're doing. You want to call in a professional. When, when Miss Mary and I were much younger, I had more hair and it was quite a bit darker, but we still had our children. We had a big station wagon and the fuel pump went out. So we had somebody come by and pick it up and take it to their shop and fix it and bring it back to me. Actually, they called me and I went and picked it up. I took it up to work and I'm sitting inside in my workplace. Somebody comes out, uh, comes into the building and says, there's something dripping out of your, the back of your car. And I go out there and I had realized that I did not use somebody who knew what they were doing because it was dripping gasoline on the ground. And when you want to have medical work done, you want to go to an expert. I want to ask you if the person in this video that I'm about to show you is somebody that you want to go to. So let's go ahead and see the video. How this works here. Okay, Novocaine. Here we are, Novocaine. Take a firm hold of the hypodermic needle. Right. be a little bit of pain and then numbness will set in. So, I don't know about you, but that's not the expert that I want to go to when I need dental work, okay? Praise the Lord. Um, when I was in children's ministry, I had a puppet that I would use ever so often. And she was the most opinionated puppet I have ever seen in my life. Her name was Miss B, and she was the definition of attitude. One of the things that she thought she was was an expert on the Bible. So she would come up occasionally and ask the kids questions. So I have, uh, let me see, one, two, three, four, I have five questions that she would ask. Now understand, she thought she was an expert on the Bible. All right, number one, who was the smartest man in the Bible? That's not what she said. She said Abraham, because he knew a lot. Okay. And what excuse did Adam give to his children as to why he no longer lived in Eden? He said, your mother ate us out of house and home. And what, now this is totally, this is how bad Miss B didn't know her Bible. This totally could not have happened. But what did Adam say on the day before Christmas? It's Christmas Eve. So Miss B was not an expert on the Bible, but let me tell you what, your family needs you to be an expert on the Word of God. And we're going to look at that tonight. You know how I know God wants you to be an expert? Because he says it in his Word. In 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, Study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And in that scripture, I see so many things jumping out at me. Number one, if I want to be approved by God, I have to know his word. And number two, I can rightly divide, which means rightly understand and apply the word of truth. Let me give you the same scripture from the Amplified Bible. It says, study and do your best 
to present yourself to God approved, a workman tested by trial, who has no reason to be ashamed, accurately handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. So what that tells me is that I can do it right or I can do it wrong. How many times have you ever had somebody quote to you the scripture that had nothing to do with your situation or to quote it out of context? I remember, you know, Louisiana is an interesting place. Mary and I lived there for 13 of the longest years of my life. And we had television preachers that you just wouldn't believe. And one of them actually said, if you send me $1,000, I'll pray for your healing. And I went, well, where, did, where exactly did he get that from the Bible? I'm not sure. Day-to-day -day challenges, and if you tell me if this isn't true in your life, come along to test your knowledge of God's word. We are constantly bombarded by things that distract us from what God wants to do in our lives. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. And this is the part that many want to remove. It exposes our inner thoughts and desires. The word of God is a tool to divide truth from lies. And the world wants to lie. You know, the devil wants us to think there are gray areas in our lives. He wants us to think that, well, you, you really, you don't have to pay your tithe. I mean, you really don't. And it's okay to laugh at certain jokes because you're witnessing. That's a confusing one. And it's okay to go certain places. It's okay to cert say certain things. Because he wants us to believe there's gray areas. But in the word of God, according to that scripture that we just read, there is no gray areas. The word of, I have something that amazed me. Why does it say in that scripture, for the word of God is alive? Anybody know the answer to that question? Wow, nobody knows. That's a good answer. How about from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, ah, now it's a person. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So, Jesus who that's talking about, is the Word. Therefore, the Word is alive. And it should be alive in us. I'm going to ask you a question now. Is it alive in you? Hold that thought. <clears throat> I have 10 points, and I'm going to go through them real quickly. How many were blessed by the pastor's message this morning? Okay, the one thing I noticed, and here's the thing, he had me so wrapped up in the message, I didn't notice it till we were walking out the door. But we went a little bit late this morning, didn't we? Just a little bit, by 12.30. And I've made a vow to Mary this morning, or this, after, this evening, and I'm making it to you, I will not go past 12 o'clock. Okay. So, <laughs> I have 10 points of why you should study the Word. Number one, how important you are to God. In Genesis, God expresses how important you are. All the wonders of God were made. He spoke them into existence. But when he made man, he did more. So when he made the stars and the sun and the earth, he spoke them into existence. Let it be, right? Let it be. But when it comes to man, in Genesis 2, 7, it says, and I'm going to show you something amazing in that scripture in just a minute. He says, and the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. You are so important to God that you are the thing that God formed himself. He didn't speak you into existence. He formed you out of the dust of the earth. You are so important to God. And then he did something else. He breathed his Holy Spirit into you. 
He breathed life. You are so important. And you know, there's something in this scripture that I never saw until I was doing this study. And that is, you know that part where he says that you are a living being? Let me read that again, because it's a very important part. It says, and the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed him in his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Do you know that there's only two sets of creatures that the Bible calls a living being. One is us, and one is celestial beings. Let me read to you from Ezekiel real quickly. Ezekiel 1 4. And I looked and we saw and I saw a windstorm coming from the north. There was a big cloud with lightning coming from it and with a bright light around it, and inside the fire was something like shining brass, and in the fire was what looked like four living beings. They looked like men, but each of them had four faces and four wings. In Revelation chapter 4, before the throne of there was what looked like a sea of glass, shining and clear. Around the throne on each side, there were four living beings. God has, in his word, said that you are so important to him, he puts you on the same level as an angel. You are so important to God. Now, I'm not talking to your neighbor. I'm talking to you. You are so important to God. He calls you the same title that he calls celestial beings. That is awesome. Man, I never, I just saw that. I, I, did a, I went to the know all, the source of all knowledge, which is Google, of course, and I put in, where is the term living beings used? In every other situation besides the one in Genesis is a, a celestial being in heaven. God says that is how important you are to him. And then we know John 3, 16 and 17. Most of the time we quote John 3, 16, but let's look at both of them. For God so loved the world, now you can take that world out and put your name. For God so loved Ralph. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You are so important to him that he gave his only son for your salvation. Now I know that seems to be something we're learning in children's church, but we need to relearn that how important we are to God. Number two, studying the Bible will build your faith. Romans 10, 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. Saving faith comes from hearing the message about Christ. And it reassures us when the enemy comes against us to make us think we're not saved. I can remember the, the first, <laughs> I've told this story before, but there's probably somebody that hasn't heard it. You know, most of y'all probably, if you've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you received it in church. I was sitting in a traffic light. I, I truly was. Because I, I, I was raised in a Catholic home and we had a lot of misunderstandings of the doctrine. And so I had to fight through 13 years I fought to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, constantly seeking. But I had all these disbeliefs and weird things in my mind, like I wasn't worthy and, and everybody else was more worthy than I was and all those crazy thoughts. And then I was sitting at a traffic light. And as clear as a bell, I heard God's voice. Take a step of faith. So right there, at a traffic light with about five cars behind me. <laughs> the light's red, and I lift my hands and begin speaking in tongues. And God showed me that I wasn't worthy because it's a gift. It's not a reward. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I had to have the faith to believe that. 
Hebrews 11, 6, but without faith it is impossible to please God. But he, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Man, that's powerful. But if I don't know that scripture, I don't know that without faith I can't please God. So I've learned two things so far in these points. Number one, that God, I am important to God and that I can rightly divide the word of truth. And when I do that, I'm approved of God. That's one. And number two, that God rewards me if I diligently seek him. Point number three, it will teach you. By opening up your Bible, God will instruct you. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Uh oh, what was that last part? I'm supposed to do good works. Wow, I didn't know that. I thought I was supposed, God, do you really want me to say that? I thought I was just supposed to sit in the pew, sit in the chair. It is the Bible which contains the total truth necessary for living, amen. Let me tell you what, the Bible teaches me that my past is not important. In fact, it teaches me not to worry about it. So there are so many Christians who are bothered by some point in their life where they made a mistake. And they constantly remember that. No matter how much salvation is preached or forgiveness, they remember that thing that they did at another church that got them in trouble or at least hurt the body of Christ. So I have a word from you from Colossians chapter two. And you being dead, this is 2.13, and you being dead in your trespasses and this uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive with him having forgiven all, everybody say all, all, not some, all your trespasses, and having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that is against us, which was contrary to us. The things that you think about, Christ has wiped out. In your mind, you have a list. In God's mind, he doesn't. He wipes out the sin. I fail God. I was at this church and I met. He wipes out the accusations against us. Listen to this. And he has taken it out of the way and has nailed it to the cross. Christ has nailed your mistakes to the cross. And how dare we try to go back to that? And well, I remember what I did. And Christ has nailed your mistakes, your sins to the cross. Who wants them back? Having, well, like this one. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he has made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. He's going, this devil is what made you afraid. I have made a spectacle of him. He is a joke. He is already defeated. And I like the next one. So let no one judge you. I don't know about you, but I had a, a person in my life. Her name was Aunt Geneva. Aunt Geneva had no filter between this and this. Absolutely no filter. And she would say just anything that came into her mind. Like, why in the world are you involved in that church? Do you remember when you... Guess what? I know because I've studied the word that I have been forgiven and my, my mistakes and my sins have been wiped out and I am set free. And it says, let no one judge me. Number five, the word of God will guide you. Proverbs 6.23, for the commandment is a lamp and the teaching is light and reproofs for discipline are the way of life. Yes. Whom the Lord loves, he what? Yes. How many have children or grandchildren? Now, I shouldn't say grandchildren because that's kind of cheating. 
You do not discipline your grandchildren as much as you did your children. And that is just the truth. Because to you, it's just so cute what they do, you know? Oh, look, she flushed her little stuffed animal down the toilet. Isn't that funny? <laughs> I mean, it, this, I didn't know this till I had granddaughters. Now that I have granddaughters, I don't discipline the way I did my, my My wife told me when we were raising our three that I, all I had to do was look at them. Now, I don't know what she's talking about, but she says I have a look. And it would just freeze them. But I never look at my granddaughters that way. But you who've raised children, did you discipline them? Why? Because you love them. You know, one of the many things that amazes me in the 21st century are the stories that my wife brings home from school about parents who don't care. We are raising a me, actually, we're already there. We're past raising. We are in the me generation. What do I get out of it? Do you know there are parents, even though school is over, are sending children to school to work with Miss Mary, and some of them are doing it because they don't want their kids in the house. Wow. God loves us. That's why he disciplines us. Psalms 119, 105, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalms 119, your commandments make me wiser than my enemies because they are mine. How about that? This is ours. Yes, it's, the God, it's God's word, but he's given it to us. This is mine. There are 6,000 promises in here and probably about 2,000 that are involved in, the, in your problems that you're dealing with. And if you don't study to show yourself approved of God, you don't even know what God says about your issue. But I'll leave that alone. Number six, the word of God will restore you when you stumble, when you fall. Psalms 19, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring my soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making the wise from the simple. I'm that last part. First John 1 John 1.8 says, if we, and I love this, if you've ever read 1 John, and you pay particular attention to 1 John, the introduction to 1 John is written to a church. That's very important. He's writing to believers. And he says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So he's telling us that occasionally we're not gonna do well. But then he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, which tells me that when I stumble and when I fall, I don't give up. I pick myself up, I tell God I'm sorry, I confess what I did, and I know that he will cleanse me of all unrighteousness. But I don't know that if I don't study to show myself approved. Number seven, the word of God will nourish you. Oh yes. First Peter, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it, you may grow in respect to salvation. Now that's a wonderful scripture. And there's nothing wrong with being on the milk of the word unless we have to part the white whiskers to give you the bottle. We are supposed to grow in the knowledge of the Lord. We are supposed to increase. You were given at the day of salvation a measure of faith, amen? But now, you are dealing with things you could not have dealt with back then. They would have wiped you out. You are stronger because you have grown in the Lord and that measure of faith that you had before has grown. I think about some of the things that Mary and I have dealt with. Her mom, some other situations in our family, our, our house being flooded twice in three months. I mean, come on. I would have thrown my hands up. But instead, I know that God is there in every situation. And I know that from studying the word of God. It nourishes me. 
1 Timothy 4, 6, in pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of faith and of sound doctrine which you have been following. It nourishes, it feeds me. Yes, that's how my faith grows. I'm not, I don't know about you, but I am not a finished product. I am a work in progress. And Mary sometimes goes amen to that one, okay? But I am a work in progress. God's working on me. He's constantly helping me to grow. And he's doing that by his word. You know, I made, I made a promise to God this year that so far I have been able to keep. And what I did was I said, Lord, I'm going to read your word fervently every week. Sometimes it'll be when I first get up. Normally, uh, if we go to the Y, Mary and I go to the Y, she exercises longer than I do because of my legs. I have to stop. So, but I've taken my Bible and I sit down and I sit there and I study the word. And here's the wonderful thing. Every message that I have preached, every message that I have had done in a Bible study has come out of my daily devotion from God. Every one of them this year so far. This one has come out of my devotion because he constantly nourishes me and feeds me. And do you ever get, do you ever get where, uh, like I'll tell you, a perfect example was yesterday. Now I can say this because she's not here. Gwen Couch made this salad, man, that was like, wow. You know, it had grapes, it had um, strawberries, it had, uh, now I, did, I, I made a mistake and asked her the ingredients, I probably shouldn't have done that, because she had goat cheese in there, and I don't like goat cheese, but I didn't care, and it was so good, it was so good, Steve, that I went to somebody else and said, man, you need to try this, well, guess what, that's what we should be doing with the word of God, we should be saying, look what I found out, man, I found out this in the Bible. This applies to your life maybe. Maybe this will help you. That's what we're supposed to do. We're not, we're not supposed to diet when we're on the word of God, okay? Some people diet. They only look at the Bible on Sundays. They're on a diet. The rest of the week, they fast the word of God, which I haven't figured out how you do that, but they have. Well, we're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to daily consume the word of God because there's never been a chance that ever comes up for you to share the word that you haven't already studied ahead of time. Unless you want to be like that guy, the dentist. You notice he was going through his manuals before he was doing the work. I don't want to be thumbing through my Bible. I want to have that word on my heart. That word, oh Lord, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. I want to have that word buried into me because I've had the weirdest things happen where I've had to testify. Told this story before, I'm gonna tell it again because it's a good example. I went over to uh, Walmart to buy some water for the food pantry. And I go through this line and this guy who works there, I give him a card that's tax free and he looks at it and he says, oh, you're from a church? And I went, yes. And he said, would you pray for me? My wife's divorcing me. And I was able to share scripture with him. And you understand there are six people behind me. And I'm, I don't have time to pull out a Bible and thumb for something. I gave him something that was on my heart. And I said, let's pray in the line. And we prayed. And when I said amen, at least four people behind me said amen with me. So we need to be ready to share the word of God. And the only way we can do that is I get so nourished. Listen, you can't get fat on the word of God. Everything else you can. but not on the word of God. Well, I guess you could if you keep it in. But I'm not supposed to keep it in, am I? I'm supposed to let it just spew forth from my mouth. I'll get off that rabbit trail. You know, it says... in that scripture that we quoted a few minutes ago about sharper than any two-edged sword. Let me read that one more time. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrows and able to judge the thoughts and intention, intentions of the heart. Let me tell you what the word of God's good for. You probably never thought about this. The word of God is good for you to be judged now by the word of God instead of at the throne. 
I'd rather be judged now and convicted by the Holy Spirit when I read the Word of God than to be standing before the throne of God and they open up the book about my life and he says, you did this and you didn't do this and you were supposed to do this and you let this go on in your life. Man, I don't want to do that. My mom's going to be there. <laughs> my mom is a Christian. My stepmom, my mother-in-law, I'm sorry. My mother-in-law is a Christian. That means that both those ladies are going to be standing there. I do not want that to happen. Because both of them will get after me. So the word of God is to help me judge myself from God's word so that I can do something about it now instead of then. Because I won't be able to do anything then except going, uh, whoops. And then I'm going to be standing there shaken, wondering if my name is in the Lamb's book of life. When if I live by the word of God, I'm going to know my, my name is in the Lamb's book of life because I've done everything in my power to study to show myself approved of God and I've done everything in my power to live a life according to that word. Number nine, it will sanctify you. You know what sanctify is? It's a daily growing more and more like Jesus Christ. It is a daily growth in Jesus Christ. John 17 says, sanctify them in the truth and your word is the truth. Wow. Wow. John 8, so Jesus therefore was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Wow. Going back to Colossians, let thy word of Christ, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom and teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing thankfulness in your hearts to God. By studying the word of God, I grow more like him, more like Jesus. It is, it is when I stop my devotion that I lose that, I slide backwards. Chuck Swindoll called it two steps forward and one step back. And number 10, the Bible reveals our future. There are so many things in there. Jeremiah 29, for I know the plans I have for you. Plans for your well-being and not for trouble to give you a future and a hope. God loves us so much. He wants to give us a future and hope. Anybody ever deal with a situation you feel is hopeless? Get in the word. John 14, let your hearts not be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you will be also. Man. I'm going to go see where Jesus is. 1 John 3, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not been yet revealed, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. What an awesome promise. Wow. You know, down here we try to be Christ-like. The Word just told me I'm going to be Christ-like. I will reach that point finally. Thank you, Jesus. But our citizenship is in heaven, says Philippians. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Praise God, I'm going to not be in this body when I go to heaven. I've worn this one out. Praise God. And the last scripture, Revelation 21. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. And death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, 
nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. We don't know these things unless we look for the truth. You know, I do remember when I wasn't a Christian and I would have a trial in my life and I would turn to it and I would always open to the Ten Commandments or to, to Leviticus or Exodus. And that didn't help me much. But now that I'm a child of God, I know this is the living word of God. I know I can draw strength from everything he has said. And I know it's mine. God has given it to me. I told you I would explain the title, Something from the Bible. And here's the explanation. Every day, we need to get something from the Bible. Every day. Because see, when you get up in the morning, you don't know what you're going to face. But God does. How many times have you read a scripture and you read it one time and it meant one thing to you? And you read another time and it meant something else to you? That's the Holy Spirit speaking to you through... You know, people say all the time, I just wish God would speak. Okay. He's spoken in 66 books. He's made over 6,000 promises. He speaks to us through his word. Can the musicians come forward, please? I hope that tonight you have been challenged to get into the word, because I'm telling you something. I don't mean to be a, a, a predictor of bad things, but it's not going to get better in this world. It's going to get worse. If you don't believe me, read the book. It's going to get better. And there's going to be some of us who are going to be surprised. I hope nobody here, this is the Sunday night crowd, so I know none of you are going to be surprised. But there's going to be some who go to church who are going to be surprised when things begin to happen. But those of us who study to show ourselves approved of God know, number one, things are going to happen. Number two, God is going to be there with us. Number three, he's going to lift us up. And number four, he's going to take us home. I encourage you, find time every day. Go online, find yourself a reading program. And listen to me, I, I, I did this when I was younger, so I want to give you a word of advice. Don't just read the word. Study to show yourself approved of God.